All right. Thanks for coming, everyone. Uh, my name is Kevin Deanna. I'm the founder of Youth for Western Civilization, the national founder. Um, Peter Brimlow is not the national founder. Uh, I'm the founder. Uh, Marcus Epstein is not the founder. I'm the founder. Uh, and for the record, I never actually wrote for the Spartan Spectator. So zero for three on the flyer. But good job, guys. Uh, anyway, I'd like to introduce uh, Alex Nepper, who will be introducing our speaker for tonight. Before, before we begin, we would like to thank the Leadership Institute. The Leadership Institute is funding this speech through the Revitalize Our Conservative Knowledge Grant Program. One of the cardinal virtues of the West is its tradition of approaching sensitive subject matters with a critical eye, of seeing things as they are rather than as we would like them to be. Robert Spencer is a scholar of the old school. He refuses to cater to sycophants. He never caves in to the pressures of those who would rather see him shut down, and he never gives an inch to his detractors. On his website, jihadwatch.org, and in his best-selling books, including the well-known Politically Incorrect Guide to Islam and his latest volume, Self-Jihad, he reveals the assault upon our values and institutions by jihadists and their sympathizers. Accessible to the layman and yet looked at with the scholar's eye, his writings both illuminate and motivate. We stand strong in the West for reason, individualism, science, capitalism, free speech and press, pluralism, minority rights, and the rule of law. All of these values are antithetical to militant Islam. Robert Spencer exposes the unvarnished truth about its roots and the threat it poses to us today. One concludes the interactions with his thoughts inspired, inspired to defend the great institutions of the West because they are so worth preserving against an enemy that would so like to tear them down. It is our privilege to introduce a true defender of Western values, Robert Spencer. Good evening. I expect that we're all here because we are interested in defending human rights. And the difficulties and the differences that we may have come from different conceptions of how that must be done and how that can be done. But I would expect that everyone in this room today, tonight, believes in the freedom of speech, the freedom of conscience, the equality of rights of all people before the law, regardless of gender, regardless of creed. I believe very strongly in all those things. And they were actually affirmed by the United Nations in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948, to which the vast majority of the nations of the world signed on to. There is, however, today a movement afoot in the world that is dedicated not to the defense of those principles and to others like them, but to the destruction of those principles. And I think, therefore, that it is incumbent upon all free people, regardless of creed, regardless of political perspective, regardless of religion, to unite to resist that imperative, that initiative, which is global in extent, and to do everything that it can to turn it back and to preserve the civilizational principles which most of the world agrees are the key elements of any truly free and truly pluralistic society. Now why is that so? Let's take pluralism in the first place. We all, I would expect, value the idea of pluralism because after all in the first place we're all different if we're going to get along we have to put up with differences we have to put up with one another we have to put up perhaps with ideas with opinions with expressions that others may find annoying this is a necessary element and some people would say is quite exciting really an exhilarating element of modern society, that so many people from so many different cultures and civilizations have come together, particularly in Western countries. The only way that we can live in harmony, the only way that we can live in peace, is by adhering to the, some, the wisdom 
of some of the cardinal principles upon which this nation was founded. One of them is non-establishment of religion. The idea of an established religion is the idea that a particular religious perspective is given a privileged position in society. In Germany, for example, you pay taxes, or at least up until recently you did. I don't know if this is actually still true, but a few years back at least, you would pay taxes to either the Catholic or the Lutheran Church. You could not opt out. If you were a German citizen, you had to pick one or the other, and part of your taxes would go to that. It's an established religion. In the United Kingdom, of course, the established religion is the Church of England. The Queen is the head of the Church of England. And it has a privileged position in society, although that too is rapidly changing. The United States was founded by people of many different religious perspectives. And so, they had a choice. They could exalt one of them, or one of them could prevail after a series, say, of bloody conflicts to impose its will upon the rest and become the one that established hegemony. Or the government, the central government, the federal government, could remain neutral, take no position on this whatsoever, not establish any religion. <coughs> and that is indeed what happened. I think it was one of the master strokes of, the, of modern world history and a particularly valuable thing that we need to preserve and to cherish precisely because we differ in conscience one um, among ourselves as to these core questions about the nature of human existence. And so if we are going to live together in peace and going to respect one another as equal human beings, then there has to be non-establishment of religion and not one group that has hegemony over the others. Freedom of speech is the same kind of thing. The United States was founded by people who engaged in offensive speech. Offensive speech is a tool of the politically disenfranchised and powerless to defend themselves against tyranny. Because, you see, when the founding fathers, as they are called, spoke out against the British crown. You may, if, you, if you haven't read the Declaration of Independence, I would highly recommend it. There is in the middle of it a long litany of grievances in which the various enormities and transgressions of King George III of England are enumerated. Now, probably when he read that, he found that offensive. Probably when he read the Declaration of Independence, he thought, this was even hateful. But from the perspective of the people who wrote the thing, who drafted the thing, and who were in favor of it, they thought that it was absolutely necessary, thank you so much, to enumerate, to, uh, enumerate the offenses of the king in order to establish a basis on which they were going to declare their independence. If they had not been able to speak freely in that regard, then his tyranny would have triumphed. If there had been laws against offensive speech, the difficulty with offensive speech, or what is called hate speech, hate speech, you know, nobody really approves of any genuine kind of hate speech, of racial slurs, or calls for violence against some group of people, something like that. That's, that's something that nobody's going to get behind. But the problem is, is that when the powerful have the power to declare, to define what constitutes hateful or offensive speech, then they can use that as a tool to silence their opponents and to solidify their tyranny. And so it is a cardinal element of a free society that freedom of speech be preserved, and a cardinal element of a genuinely pluralistic society that there be non-establishment of religion. So what does all this have to do with the matter at hand? Well, I'll tell you. There was released a few years back a document 
that was a secret internal document of a group called the Muslim Brotherhood. The Muslim Brotherhood, as many of you are no doubt aware, is an international organization that was founded in Egypt in 1928 in order to reassert elements of Islam as envisioned by the founder of the Brotherhood, Hassan al-Banna, that he thought and his followers thought had been de-emphasized or even forgotten and needed to be revived, both for the sake of Islam and for the sake of the world at large. Notably, the Hilafa, the Caliphate, the symbol of the supranational unity of the Muslims, the symbol of their being one people above and beyond national boundaries, above and beyond any and all other allegiances, the successor of Muhammad as the leader of the Muslims. Even though the caliph, by the time the office was abolished in 1924 by the new secular Turkish government, it was, he was basically a symbol and a figurehead. Nonetheless, it was a very potent symbol. And it was one that Hassan al-Banna, when he founded the Brotherhood four years later, explicitly pointed out as being part of his motivation for doing so, to restore, ultimately, this supranational unity and to extend the prerogatives of political Islam over the world. And he believed, Albana believed, the founder of the Brotherhood, that these elements of Islam as a political and social system were revealed by God. And it was the responsibility, said Albana, of the Muslims, of all believers, to work to bring that system of society and laws to the world at large for the benefit of the world at large because it was the perfect ordering of any genuinely good society. The Brotherhood is now an international organization. It operates under several names in the United States, most notably the Muslim American Society, as well as the Islamic Society of North America, Council on American Islamic Relations, the Muslim Students Association, the Islamic Circle of North America, the North American Islamic Trust, and various others. And how is it that I am telling you that they are Brotherhood or Brotherhood-linked organizations, that comes from the word of the Brotherhood itself, in this document to which I was referring, and am referring. In 1991, the Brotherhood in the United States held this conference in order to solidify what they called, in the final document, the group's strategy and goals for the United States. This document was never intended to be released to the general public, and it never was until the Holy Land Foundation trial. The Holy Land Foundation was, up until a couple of years ago, the largest Muslim charity in the United States. It was shut down because there are laws against giving money to groups that the State Department has classified as terrorist organizations. The State Department has classified Hamas, the Islamic resistance movement, among the Palestinians, as a terrorist organization, and it turned out that the Holy Land Foundation was indeed giving money to Hamas. <coughs> so Holy Land Foundation was shut down, and many of its documents were impounded by authorities, and they were tried, actually twice, because the first one ended in a mistrial, and ultimately found guilty of funneling this money, charitable contributions, to Hamas. But one of the most extraordinary documents to come out in the midst of this trial was this memorandum on the Muslim Brotherhood strategy and goals for the United States. And it says many interesting things, but just one for the sake of brevity, I will quote to you. It says, the Muslim Brotherhood must understand that their work in America is a kind of grand jihad, which means struggle in Arabic, in eliminating and destroying the Western civilization from within and sabotaging its miserable house by their hands and the hands of the believers so that it is eliminated and Allah's religion is made victorious over all other religions. Now the idea of Allah's religion being made victorious over all other religions, you must understand, is not simply a statement of religious piety 
as in perhaps the hope that a believer of any creed might express that one day everyone will come to see the light of the truth of his particular creed, it is rather a political statement stemming from the Brotherhood's political agenda having to do with the imposition of Islamic law in its traditional form over the West. And so <clears throat> this is actually a strategy and a goal that is being pursued in the United States today by Brotherhood organizations and other allied groups. And it is an initiative that is directed against the principles that I explained at the beginning. The freedom of speech, the freedom of conscience, the equality of rights of all people before the law, and so on. I can give you a few examples. The uh, Islamic law, as envisioned by the Brotherhood, and as envisioned by its allied organizations, in the first place, is a model that does not contain the idea of all people being equal before the law. Omar Ahmed is the co-founder and the former board chairman of the Council on American Islamic Relations. He, along with Nihad Awad, founded the Council on American Islamic Relations in 1994. They came out of, they had been officers of another group that no longer exists called the Islamic Association for Palestine, which has been since also shut down for its connections to Hamas. Hamas considers itself, as, as, as explained in its charter, to be the Muslim Brotherhood branch in Palestine. And so the Council on American Islamic Relations has this rather direct connection to the Brotherhood itself, as well as one that has been reaffirmed also by Nihad Awad when he said in 1994, the same year that CARE was founded, that he was in support of the Hamas movement. In any case, Omar Ahmed speaking to a group in California in 1998, he said, Islam isn't in America to be equal to any f other faith, but to become dominant. Islam isn't in America to be equal to any other faith, but to become dominant. The Quran should be the highest authority in America, and Islam the only accepted religion on earth. Now see, this is where I think any lover of freedom and anyone who understands the necessity of non-establishment, the necessity of respecting other human beings in conscience so as to respect that people will come to differing points of view, has to reject the statement and has to reject the initiative that it represents. <coughs> anyone who believes in genuine pluralism will not want any one group to be dominant but will understand that that give and take of all the groups, with none of them being favored over the other, but all of us living together in harmony and peace, is what makes for a genuinely free and pluralistic society, and not one in which it becomes impossible to express certain points of view. But the freedom of speech is also under serious threat by this same initiative. The organization of the Islamic Conference is 57 Muslim governments around the world. It is the largest voting bloc in the United Nations right now. And it has been dedicated over the last few years to a campaign against what it calls Islamophobia. Now Islamophobia is something that is defined as a kind of irrational hatred akin to racial bigotry that one might conceive toward Muslims or toward Islam itself. Now, Islamophobia is a phenomenon that's really very interesting. For one thing, it's noteworthy that you never hear of Buddhistophobia or Hindu phobia. You don't hear about these things. Nobody seems to conceive, in other words, irrational hatreds toward any other group. And why is it that there would be anyone who might conceive of any kind of hatred at all? Well, hatred is a bad thing. But of course, all of us would agree, I am sure, 
that we should resist evil. And when people are committing violence in the name of Islam and explaining what they're doing by reason, by, by virtue of Islamic texts and teachings, as Osama bin Laden does and as so many others do around the, around the world, you may note in his October 6, 2002 address to the American people, he heads it with Quran chapter 2239, permission to fight is given to you against those who have oppressed you in various ways. And he con continues with many Quran quotes. Khalid Sheikh Mohammed also and the other 9-11 plotters in a recent statement, they explained that they were doing what they were doing in the name of Islam and because of Islamic teachings. Now, of course, there are many Muslims here, and I know that you're going to say, yes, but they're all wrong. We, they're twisting the religion. They don't understand it. They're misrepresenting it. And you yourself are evil for even daring to suggest that what they are doing has anything to do with Islam. Well, fair enough. But actually, the reality of the situation is, is that this is what they say they're doing and why they say they're doing it. Whether they're right or wrong, we need to understand what they're doing and why they say they're doing it in order to be able to resist it properly. Whether we are Muslims or non-Muslims, whatever perspective we may have ourselves, we need to understand what they say they're about and why. Now, coming back to Islamophobia, the difficulty becomes when the organization of the Islamic Conference says that they are not just trying to resist people who have some kind of irrational hatred, but people who actually try to just simply explore the motives and the goals of people like Osama bin Laden and Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and Omar Bakri and Abu Hamza in England and Abu Bakar Bashir in Indonesia and uh, Anjum Chowdhury also in England, so many others all around the world who consistently refer to Islamic texts and teachings to explain what they're doing. I would submit to you that there's nothing hateful it is not an act of hatred to explore the mode stated, explicitly stated motives and goals of those who have vowed to destroy what I have tried to explain to you are valuable principles of any truly free and pluralistic society. It is not hateful to examine what they say, to try to understand their point of view, and to try to formulate ways in which this initiative can be resisted so that all people, Muslims, non-Muslims, Hindus, Buddhists, Christians, Jews, atheists, whatever, can live together in peace and respect one another's differences while working together in whatever they may see eye to eye on. And so the difficulty becomes when the organization of the Islamic Conference, and this has been quite explicit about this, says that it is an act of Islamophobia, not just to have some sort of irrational hatred, which certainly would be unjustified under any circumstances, but not to have any hatred at all, but simply to speak about the motives and goals of the terrorists, such that it becomes a rather ludicrous thing. Osama bin Laden quotes Quran 22, chapter 22, verse 39, and that's fine. But if somebody else who is a non-Muslim, perhaps, or a counter-terrorism consultant, perhaps, says Osama bin Laden quotes Quran 2239, then the OIC would say that was Islamophobia. That was hateful and it ought to be criminalized. Now, I think that's ludicrous. It's not only ludicrous, it's dangerous. And it's dangerous because if we cannot understand the opponent, then we will never be able to defeat the opponent. The opponent who has vowed to destroy, eliminate and destroy Western civilization from within and sabotage its miserable house, in the words of the Muslim Brotherhood memo. And we won't be able to talk about it. We won't be able to explore why it is that they're doing this and what they hope to accomplish. And if we can't do that, then we can't figure out how to keep it from happening. And so the organization of the Islamic Conference has actually gone to the UN and has succeeded in getting resolutions passed criminalizing this kind of discussion. Now, that is not binding in the United States at this time. And that's why we're having this talk tonight. However, I would suggest to you 
that if it were to become binding in the United States, which I think is a very real possibility, that we would all be the losers. We would all be the poor, Muslim, non-Muslim, whatever. Because if we value, if and only if, we value a society that does indeed guarantee the freedom of speech, which is a guarantee against tyranny, and the non-establishment of religion, which is a guarantee against another kind of tyranny, and the freedom of conscience, which is also denied, and various other principles which are denied by the vision of Islamic law that is, that is put forward by the Brotherhood then we will lose those rights. We will lose those privileges. We will lose those elements of the society because they are being directly challenged. It is, I must emphasize to you, not something that cannot be objectively verified. You can say, well, Spencer came in here and he said all this, but nobody ever heard of these things. Well, check it out for yourself. Was there a Muslim Brotherhood Memorandum, 1991, signed by Muhammad Akram, who was a Muslim Brotherhood operative? An explanatory memorandum on the general strategic goal for the group, the Brotherhood in, the, in North America. Look it up. I'm not making it up. Did Omar Ahmed say these things about Islamic supremacism and replacing the Constitution with the Quran in 1998? Look it up. Don't believe me. Check it out. But you will see that all these things are going on, and there are many others that I could, well, I'll give you a few before I close. The, uh, actually, the Brotherhood leader right now, Muhammad Akif, has said that, uh, I have complete faith that Islam will invade Europe and America because Islam has a logic and a mission. Now, invade is a choice of words that is noteworthy because he's not talking about the spread of a religion, people converting to a religion as a free act of conscience. Nobody could have any possible objection to that. But when he's talking about invading, then there is the suggestion of establishing or imposing a political order. A political order that Muslims as well as non-Muslims ought to be opposing. Same thing from a Hamas parliamentarian as well as Islamic cleric Yunus al astal who said last year on Al-Aqsa television, very soon, God willing, Rome will be conquered just like Constantinople was, as was prophesied by our prophet Muhammad, and of course in the Hadith, you know, he did indeed prophesy that. And it says, today Rome is the capital of the Catholics, or the Crusader capital. This capital of theirs will be an advanced post for the Islamic conquests, which will spread through Europe in its entirety, and then we'll turn to the two Americas. Now, I'd like to say that this is, you know, just a lot of uh, braggadocio, bravado. This kind of thing could never happen. That would be extraordinarily reassuring, were it true. But unfortunately, there are the groups that I named earlier and others that are working to establish this goal in the United States in various ways right now. These ways range far and wide beyond acts of terrorism, and we can perhaps explore that in the question period, but I want to leave a good amount of time for questions, so I will leave that for then. But in any case, um, in conclusion, this is something, this whole issue has been clouded over, has been obscured by people who have an interest in making sure that it is obscured as far as you are concerned. And it is an initiative, as I have explained to you, in defense of human rights, in defense of the equality of dignity of all people, the equality of rights of all people. To characterize this as an act of hatred is only to try to divert your attention away from what it really is doing and to allow the people who are forwarding the initiative to continue to do so unimpeded. Nor does this have anything to do with tarring all Muslims or all believers in Islam or all believers in anything as being on board with some pernicious agenda. That would be ridiculous. There is among Muslims around the world, over well over a billion Muslims, a spectrum of belief and of knowledge and of fervor just as there is among the believers of any religious tradition. But that does not mitigate the unfortunate fact 
that the people who are trying to put forward this initiative are indeed doing so by claiming for themselves the mantle of Islamic authenticity. And they even recruit among peaceful Muslims by appealing to them and saying, we represent the true, the pure, the authentic Islam. You are not truly a fully or fully a Muslim unless you are on board with our agenda. Now, of course, it should be obvious to Muslims as well as non-Muslims that any Muslim who is not on board with their agenda has to and energetically reject that and reject that appeal. <coughs> but that is something that's really beyond the purview of the talk. The only difficulty that we have is that those who are forwarding this agenda try to portray it falsely as something that is tarring an entire group with some pernicious goal. Anybody who does not want to be tarred with that pernicious goal need only to work against it to dispel any kind of false impression of that kind. In any case, therefore, I call upon, in conclusion, all free people to join me in this. Anybody who values the equality of rights of all people, the freedom of speech, non-establishment of religion, all these principles, these hard-won principles of our society and other societies, anybody who values these things and does not want to see them obscured or damaged or taken away altogether, we need to join together now and to resist this in the name of peace and in the name of freedom. Thank you very much. So I'd ask you if you have questions, not to please give a counter lecture. Uh, I was invited to speak. I appreciate it if you have something equal of import to say, and I will do my best to be there when you schedule your own talk. However, this is the time that I was scheduled, and so with all respect, I would ask you to actually ask a question and not just go off and uh, give your own alternative address and try to keep the questions brief so that we can get in as many as possible because I tend to be long-winded in the answers. Sorry. Hello. Hello. Yes, sir. Long-term admirer. I wish there was a lot more like you. Thank you. to actually finally hear you. Your, your title is, uh, or, or this group is Youth for Western Civilization, but given what's happening in Western China, <coughs> given what's happening in India, given what's happening in the Philippines, given what's happening in Southern Thailand, isn't it kind of a, this problem a threat to all civilization? Yeah. And how are the Easterner uh, civilizations dealing with it? And can we learn anything from that? Thank you. That's an excellent set of observations and questions. In the first place, uh, I should say something about this. Because a lot of these things, these uh, falsehoods are being spread about this group and trying to tar me in the process. I'm used to this kind of thing happening. But I do want to make clear one thing, several things about this. In the first place, with all respect to the organizers of this event, and I do not mean any insult to you, but I'm just going to tell the truth. I never heard of this group. I never heard of this group until I saw the Council on American Islamic press release saying that I was speaking for this group, and I thought I am. I was invited by the Leadership Institute, and that's all I knew. Now, this group, I have nothing against Western civilization. I actually like it very much. but. Uh, and I do not believe, based on the uh, information that I've been given, I do not believe that this group is a racist group or anything like that, or I would not be here. But Western civilization is by no means the only civilization that is threatened. And you notice that I didn't actually speak about Western civilization in the main talk, but noted, but noted at the beginning that the uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which was signed by countries all over the world of the UN in 1948, is what uh, encapsulates a lot of these rights that I'm speaking of as being threatened. Now, it is certainly true, yes, India, Indonesia, the Philippines, Thailand, Kashmir, Nigeria, there are many, many other places where there are groups that are holding exactly the same ideology, exactly the same belief system and trying to subjugate the non-Muslims in those areas under their rule and relegate them to an inferior status that would deny them equality of rights before the law. And so we need to join together as a global movement with all those people. 
But the part of your question as to how we, uh, what we might learn from the responses in various Eastern countries, I don't, at least as far as I know, have much to recommend in that regard. I mean, the People's Republic of China has a problem with, the, with these groups, the East Turkestan Islamic Movement and others in Western China. And, you know, the People's Republic of China is just is another kind of tyranny and is a ruthless regime. And uh, that's one of the reasons why they don't have as much of a problem with Islamic jihadists as other places in the world do. But I certainly would not recommend their methods. And India, conversely, has reacted with, in such a supine fashion as only to give the appearance of weakness and to encourage more aggressiveness on the part of the groups there. And so those are two sides of the coin that I would hope that we would be able to avoid in the West. And uh, certainly not succeeded very well in avoiding them so far. But in any case, the way forward ought to be clear that adhering to our own principles, the principles of our own civilization, we ought to be able to defend them. And if we discard them while trying to defend them, then the whole process is self-defeating. Any others? Yes, sir. Um, what do you think are the best ways to improve relations between the U.S. and the Muslim world and between Muslims and non-Muslims in the United States? Well, in the first place, I would say that knowledge, a full awareness of the reality of the problem is essential and is very rare at the highest levels. In the first place, the United States under George W. Bush and now in the Obama administration also is pursuing, more so now, but certainly also then, it's really a, a continuity more than a discontinuity, pursuing policies based on the assumption that the problems between the United States and various Islamic groups and Islamic nations stems from American foreign policy and various actions that the United States has done and can thus have the power to correct. That if only we weren't in Iraq, if only we weren't in Afghanistan, if only we weren't such a friend of Israel, if only we hadn't toppled the Mossadegh regime in Iran in 1953, if only this and that, if we, in other words, made the requisite adjustments to our foreign policy, then this problem would disappear. If only we give enough money to what are called under, underdeveloped nations like Pakistan, Egypt, notably Indonesia, and so on, and then this problem will disappear. And so this policy, these policies have been pursued uh, rather in a rather thoroughgoing manner for a decade and more. And they have not borne any fruit. And I think that they have not borne any fruit and have only made things worse because they perceive they're based upon some fundamental misapprehensions. In the first place, I think that they're ethnocentric. And it's a funny thing in this multicultural age that people who are some of the strongest, foremost exponents of multiculturalism would turn out to be operating from ethnocentric assumptions. It is actually belittling, it's disrespectful, I would submit to you, to assume in a conflict that it's all your fault. There are two sides to every story. And if you value the other person, the other party, as an equal, then you have to grant that they have some mind of their own and are not just a passive reactor to what you do. And so the age-old question, or at least the eight-year-old question, why do they hate us? The answer may not be, and I submit to you that it is not, because of anything that we've done. Certainly there are many things that we have done and that we are that are used by jihadist groups to exacerbate grievances and to gain recruits. But ultimately, I don't think that, I think that it's simply a matter of respect to listen, to have the patience to listen and to investigate what the leaders of the various jihad movements around the world are saying that they're doing this for. And then we find that they are saying that they hate us, not for any reason, based on what we have done. Even the letter from the 9-11 plotters just a few weeks ago said this again. It said, you know, you're doing these terrible things in Palestine and you're doing these terrible things in Iraq and so on and so on. But there's a very telling sentence in there 
it said, even if you weren't doing any of these, of these things, we would still be fighting against you because you were unbelievers. Chapter 9, verse 29 of the Quran says, Fight against those who do not believe in Allah or his messenger, and do not forbid what they have forbidden, what he has forbidden. Until, even if they are of the people of the book, which is the Quranic designation primarily for Jews and Christians, until they pay the jizya, which is the tax, with willing submission and feel themselves subdued. Now, that's a, a single verse from the Quran, and you can say, well, you're taking a verse out of the Quran. I could take so many verses out of the Bible. That, uh, yes, 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 very well. You do that. But in the meantime, I'm going to look at the schools of Islamic jurisprudence, the four Sunni schools, the four primary Sunni schools, the Shafi'i, Maliki, Hanafi, and Hanbali schools, the Shiite schools, and they all agree that it is part of the imperative of the Ummah, the Islamic community worldwide, to wage war against unbelievers and to subjugate them. Muhammad, in, in this is Sahih Muslim uh, number 4294, said when you meet the unbelievers in battle, you invite them to three courses of action. One, you invite them to accept Islam. Two, you invite them to pay the jizya, which is to enter into the Islamic social order with this second class status that makes sure that they feel themselves subdued, as per the Quranic verse. Or three, you go to war with them. Now, here again, this doesn't mean that every Muslim is pursuing this agenda any more than the fact that the Catholic Church teaches against contraception means that no Catholics contracept. Actually, most do, according to surveys. You know, religious dogma is one thing, and people's lives are another. But the reality is, is that these things are being taught. And they teach that one must proceed against these groups, primarily Jews and Christians, no matter what they may have done or not done, but simply by virtue of what they are. Now, if we understand that, I don't think that that means that precludes the possibility of any kind of cooperation with Islamic entities or even with nations. But it would keep us from pursuing a lot of blind alleys and self-defeating policies. If all this were out in the open and these teachings were openly discussed instead of denied and obfuscated all the time, then we might be, I think we actually would find considerable numbers of Muslims in the Islamic world and in the West who would say that actually they would prefer to live under a Western model of, of a pluralistic society rather than under Islamic law, and thus have no interest in pursuing this agenda. But we cannot possibly cultivate them as allies without even acknowledging the basis on which they could become allies. And so there's been so many self-defeating policies pursued over these last few years that the situation just keeps becoming more and more muddled. Yes, sir. Hi. Um, obviously, you know, our group is calling your youth for Western civilization. And one of the issues we're I'm, I'm for Western civilization. I like it. It's great to hear. I'm for <laughs> Put me down as pro Western civilization. Check it out. Um, one of the issues, you know, we talked about earlier, we screened, you know, the movie uh, Fitna. You know, one of yeah. the issues we talked about was, uh, you know, the issue of um, in Europe where you have very, very large migrant populations do hold, you know, to orthodox, you know, as long as principles that may not mesh with the countries that they're in, and it mm -hmm. caused issues, you know, relating to free speech, and may cause, you know, even more issues down the road. And I guess the question I have is, do you agree that that is a problem that's going on, and if so, you know, is there a way Certainly to counteract that? And if, if, I guess if you do believe that, is that a possibility of anything like that happening in the United States? Well, certainly there is. Both yes on both counts. Uh, look, Fitna is very controversial, and everybody hates it. But if you actually see it, it's a Quran verse. It starts with eight, chapter 8, verse 60 from Al Anfal, the 8th chapter of the Quran. And it says that uh, make ready the steeds of war and so on uh, to strike terror into the enemies, the hearts of the enemies of Allah and your enemies. And then it proceeds to show 9 11 and the Madrid bombings in Spain from 2004, March 11th, 2004, in Madrid, and Muslim preachers saying, strike terror into the hearts of the enemies, quoting chapter 8, verse 60 of the Quran, and exhorting to violence on that basis. And so the, the, the lacuna here, the funny thing about this, is exactly what I referred to before, that Heert Wilders, the Dutch parliamentarian who put the film together, 
is vilified around the world and is subject to prosecution, when actually all he did was put a few stock footage together of Muslim preachers referring to Quran verses and exhorting to violence on their bases, and quote the Quran verse. So why aren't those preachers being prosecuted instead of builders? Why is it that it's not hateful when they say these things in mosques in Baghdad and in the Palestinian Authority and all over the world? That's not hateful, but it's hateful when he quotes them. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous and it's transparent. It's transparently, nakedly dishonest. And uh, I'm not going to fall for it. You know, this kind of thing is done all the time to me also. And uh, the fact is, you know, the book says what it says, and there are preachers who preach violence on that basis. I didn't make that up. Neither did Wilders. Are there people like that in Europe who are preaching these things? In mosques in Europe? Oh, most certainly. And I can give you abundant, you can find abundant documentation of that at uh, Jihad Watch, jihadwatch.org, on the web, many other places. And this is something that is increasingly a problem in Europe. Because there are areas like Malmo in Sweden, uh, the Molenbeek district of Antwerp in Belgium, uh, various areas of East London, some areas of Paris, which uh, no longer accept the state authority, but they only accept, they only acknowledge the rule of Islamic law. Ultimately, this is going to create more and more conflict because, because of the expansionist imperative that these groups manifestly and explicitly, by their own words, believe in, they're going to continue to impinge upon the larger community and expand at its expense. So that there is, the conflict is perhaps, is, is, is practically inevitable. And the difficulty is compounded by the fact that it is not allowed to be discussed that when one quotes these preachers in what they're preaching, and there's plenty of them, then that's hateful. And yet nobody seems to say, wait a minute, the hate is coming from the mosques where these guys are preaching. Maybe we need to do something about that and prosecute those people. Various weak and ineffectual efforts to do that have been undertaken in France and the Netherlands and elsewhere. But those have to be stepped up considerably. And the situation is uh, very serious in Europe. Um, I think that it's not in the least unlikely that there will be Muslim majorities and Islamic states in various areas of Europe within the next few decades. And that this will cause conflict on a massive scale, both within Europe and with the United States. Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> yes. What do you Ma'am, and the. I just wanted to know your opinion uh, about uh, how the Jews believe that they are God's chosen people and the establishment of Israel based on that it runs from the Nile to the Euphrates and it's happening by the killings of Palestinian Christians and Muslims and the settlements and, you know, all that. <coughs> My opinion on it? I'm not quite sure how to evaluate that. Um, but I don't really think there's any comparison in scale. Even if what you were saying was the stated policy of the state of Israel, which I don't believe that it is, the dial to the Euphrates thing, I know there's a lot of uh, contentiousness about that, but uh, certainly if it is their policy, it's, it's hidden, it's, uh, it's, it's stealthy, um, very stealthy, uh, particularly in light of the withdrawal from Gaza and so on. It seems that if they have an expansionist imperative, they're doing a real good job of concealing it. But in the meantime, um, there's no comparison in scale between uh, even if Israel had such designs upon land to the Euphrates to the jihadist movements which you find around the world. And so one would wonder why all the attention is paid upon Israel. Now that's not to say that if an injustice is done it shouldn't be investigated and, and prosecuted, but the difficulty is further compounded by the fact that it is manifest that those injustices have been manufactured to a tremendous degree. That Hamas has been acknowledged even by the United Nations 
as launching attacks from civilian areas, Hezbollah also, and using civilians as human shields in order to draw retaliatory fire that they could use and did use for propaganda purposes. This makes it very difficult to evaluate claims of uh, so-called genocide or Israeli incursions against civilians uh, when also you have the fact that when there are actions in which Israeli soldiers have transgressed the prohibitions against acting against civilians, then they're prosecuted in Israel, not celebrated as heroes in posters of the suicide bombers and so on that are popular in the Palestinian Authority. So uh, I think that there is a very sophisticated campaign to uh, stir up hatred against Israel and to demonize Israel today and that that is proceeding on the basis of these exaggerated claims of atrocities and grievances that are actually fostered and often staged by these groups. And this is a matter of, uh, this is a matter of record. You can uh, check this out. As a matter of fact, the, the intifada that was touched off by the Mohammed al-Dura shooting is the most notorious example. And France, too, the, the television channel that has all the footage, it's finally released enough of the footage to show that the whole thing was a staged event and that there was no murder of Mohammed al-Dura by Israeli soldiers. This is just one of many examples in which civilians have been used as essentially as props in a grievance theater. Um, now this is not to say that there should not be a just solution for the people there, but uh, the question becomes whether any just solution is possible also given the intransigence and totalistic vision of the jihadist ideology, as enunciated by both the charters of Hamas and Fatah, that will not settle for any state of Israel in any area of the Middle East, because this is all part of the Dar al-Islam. This is all part of land that belongs by right to the Muslims. The idea is essentially one that was enunciated by Maulana Maldudi, the Pakistani jihad theorist, author of Towards Understanding the Quran and many other very influential books. And he said non-Muslims, actually this is his exegesis, this is his commentary on chapter 9 verse 29 of the Quran, which I quoted earlier. Non-Muslims have absolutely no right to wield the reins of power, political power, in any part of God's earth. And if they do, the believers are under the obligation to dislodge them from that power by any means possible. That is ultimately the challenge that the state of Israel faces as being a polity that is considered to be illegitimate on the basis of the fact that non-Muslims have no right to political power, particularly in lands that are considered Islamic. And so the refugee problem has been artificially prolonged. The, uh, oh yeah, this is the first refugee uh, situation in history where refugee status is passed on to children and grandchildren of the people who actually left the area. Uh, you have, in, you know, there were huge population displacements and transfers after World War II. And certainly there were some that were, uh, that were handled very poorly. Robert, I'm sorry to now because the, we only have the room for one hour. Is that right? Yeah. I was just getting going. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Well, hey, I'm sorry too. It's been great, really. You've been a wonderful group. It's so nice to talk to you. And anyway, I would encourage you to look into that further. There is a great deal of confusion on these issues and a great deal of, 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 of misinformation and disinformation. Never underestimate the uh, power of deception. And as Muhammad said, war is deception. War is deceit. And so this is used as a tool of war by those who would impose this vision of Islamic law upon the rest of us. And so I would look for the deceptions coming from the people who consider that to be a legitimate uh, tool of warfare and look into the reality of the situation. You might find it very illuminating. Anyway, thanks. It's been great.
I'm sorry. You send me all this stuff and I don't put it up. I'm sorry. It's it's nothing precious. It's usually, I, I never leave my problem with that. Yeah, this is very important. Nobody yelling, nobody screaming. 